A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, King Herod laid hands upon some members of the church to harm them. He had James, the brother of John, killed by the sword. And when he saw that this was pleasing to the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He had him taken into custody and put in prison under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. He intended to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter thus was being kept in prison, but prayer by the church was fervently being made to God on his behalf. On the very night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter, secured by double chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while outside the door, guards kept watch on the prison. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and awakened him, saying, Get up quickly. The chains fell from his wrists. The angel said to him, Put on your belt and your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Put on your cloak and follow me. So he followed him out, not realizing that what was happening through the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first guard, then the second, and came to the iron gate leading out to the city, which opened for them by itself. They emerged and made their way down an alley, and suddenly the angel left him.
A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. I, Paul, am already being poured out like a libation, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've competed well, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, the crown of righteousness awaits me, which the Lord, the just judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearance. The Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the proclamation might be completed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil threat and will bring me safe to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Erbom Domini. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundo Matteo. Gloria When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for my flesh for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verbum Domini. It has to take something special uh, to supersede the regular Sunday scripture readings 
and texts for the Mass. And so that's what happened today. Something superseded a regular Sunday observance. And it is a very special day for the Latin Rite. Today we honor uh, the great founders of the Church of Rome, uh, the two great saints of Rome, St. Peter and St. Paul. And when we think of St. Peter and St. Paul, don't our minds often think of the city of Rome? Uh, when we go to Rome, that's one of the main places we go to visit, is St. Peter's Basilica. You know, if you think about it, we say, well, if I say Washington, D.C. to any American, the image that will come to your mind is the great dome of the Capitol or that uh, obelisk of the George Washington Monument. If I say um, Moscow, you think of that multicolored uh, church that's there. But if I say Rome, you don't think of a Capitol building. You think of St. Peter's Basilica. And then we also think again of these figures, not only of St. Peter, but of St. Paul, who has a beautiful basilica right outside of the walls of the old city. This is what we have in a hymn in honor of these two saints from the divine office. What fairer light is this than time itself doth own? The golden day with beams more radiant brightening, the princes of God's church this feast day doth enthrone. To sinners heavenward bound their burden lightening. One taught mankind its creed, one guards the heavenly gate. Founders of Rome, they bind the world in loyalty, one by the sword achieved, one by the cross his fate. With laureled brows they hold eternal royalty. Rejoice, O Rome, this day. Thy walls they once did sign with princely blood, who now their glory share with thee. What city's vesture glows with crimson deep as thine? What beauty else has earth that may compare with thee? So very beautiful poem, really looking and saying to the city of Rome, rejoice because you have in you, your walls are marked with princely blood. This is what we call uh, Peter and Paul and the apostles, these princes of Christ who gave their blood and so gave this uh, nobility forever with, to the city of Rome. Rome was known in the secular world as uh, this um, who brought uh, peace and order and a certain governance to the known civilized world. Many of our manners of government today are based on what Rome had accomplished. And yet we say in this poem, Rome isn't known today for that. <laughs> but because of these holy men and because of the faith that they professed. And here is the center in the heart of our church where the gospel is preached. If we want to know and have solidity in our faith, what do we say? We need to be united with Peter in Rome. We need to be united with the one true faith taught by these apostles and given witness to by the shedding of their blood. In the preface of the Mass today, uh, we will refer to Peter who established the early church from the remnant of Israel, and Paul, the master and teacher of the Gentiles that you call, that God calls. Now we know that Peter also spoke to the Gentiles. We know that Paul also spoke uh, to the Jews. But isn't that how St. Paul so often characterized himself? Just as St. Peter preaches to the Jewish faithful, I am sent to preach to the Gentile nations. 
Notice how the church phrases that prayer. Peter, who established the early church from the remnant of Israel. So the remnant is this faithful few, those who were really had their hearts open and longing for this Messiah, wanting to know the Messiah. And Peter was preaching to them, most specifically laying out for them and helping them to come to faith in Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of the promise of the Father. And that Jesus is that Messiah who has come and, and, and has redeemed us. And so there's this reference to this remnant. So it sounds like a small number that Peter worked with in order to uh, establish the beginnings of this church. And then Paul, the master and teacher of the Gentiles, you call. So Peter's going to the faithful few. Paul is going out to the unbelieving masses. So he's going to the Gentiles who aren't even looking for a Messiah. You know, if you say Messiah to the Israelites, they might pay attention. If you say Messiah to the Gentiles at that time, they'll say, huh? You know, and that's who Paul's going to in these masses into the, the whole world. And both of them end up basically in the end of their life in the city of Rome. Paul there brought in chains, uh, ultimately to be beheaded by the sword. Peter, who is there working uh, among uh, the faithful, and then is imprisoned and put to death on the cross. He who in his death um, identified uh, so closely with Christ. Peter, who was uh, Christ's vicar on earth, said at the moment of his death they were going to crucify him just the way they crucified our Lord and Peter recognizing who he was said I'm unworthy to die that the way that in the same fashion that my master died and so they crucified him upside down I want to look at uh, just briefly their their names and drawing really from the gospel passage but we all know that Paul used to be called Saul and we know that in the change of him going and working among the Gentiles that his name uh, he would be known instead of with his Jewish name he'd be known as Paul but I think the Lord himself had that change made uh, for him in his new mission and very clearly with Peter, that is the case. That his name, he's not Simon, but he's Rock. And so he um, identifies, Jesus gives him this new identity for his new mission in the church. This is what happens uh, in religious life. That a man or a, a woman's name is changed. Identifying them, yes, as a, a member of a new family, a religious family, but also giving them a new identity uh, that is not associated with the world, but an identity associated with the mission that God is entrusting to them. You also see this with the Holy Father. You know, when someone by the name of Bill is elected, he doesn't come out on the balcony and they say, well, here's Pope Bill Smith, you know, we always hear, you know, just even recently with Pope Francis, you know, they, here comes this cardinal out there and is announcing this to us in Latin. With great joy, we announce to you that, you know, Jorge Bergoglio has been elected as our new pope. And everybody's like, who is Jorge Bergoglio? And then he's, they say he's going to be known as Pope Francis. And when he comes out on the balcony, everybody knows who he is. They say, oh, that's Pope Francis, you know, that's who that is. And he has this new identity in this great mission that has been entrusted to him. This is very much linked to what Peter did, or what Jesus did with Peter in the Gospel passage. It's also very telling, I think it's unique, and this has been pointed out to us many times before, that Jesus says to him, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. So you're going you're gonna to be the solid rock. That's who you are. 
That's who he identifies Peter as. And then we look closer at Peter and say, well, he's not a solid rock. You know, he's only that solid rock because Jesus, because God has made him that way. In and of himself, he's quite the opposite. This is the man who, in his own confidence, gets out there on the water. You know, it's you, Lord. Okay, so I hop out there on the water. Call me to yourself if it's you. Okay, come, Peter. He takes two steps, and all of a sudden, you know, where's the rock? Well, he's sinking. You know, that's what happens to a rock in the water. But it's his lack of faith that makes him weak and makes him falter. Here's Peter at the Last Supper, you know, Lord, everyone else may deny you. I will never deny you. Before the cock crows, you will deny me. You will have denied me three times, Peter. And there we read in the scripture once, twice, three times, I do not know the man. And our Lord gives him this great opportunity do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Those questions after the resurrection. St. Augustine says, to our Lord asked Peter three times, do you love me, in order to untie the knot that Peter had tied. He got himself tied up in knots with his denial of the Lord. And our Lord gives him the opportunity to set things straight. Peter knew who he was. That's the beauty of this saint. You know, as he went through the rest of his life and exercised his ministry, he was a humble man. He knew that he had denied the Lord. He knew that he was a man who was weak in faith. And yet he had this great confidence and great strength to give us solidity in our faith. He is that rock upon which the Church of Christ is built because the call came from God. It wasn't Peter in and of himself, it's because of what the Lord did with him. And this is what he recognized in that radical humility. Here he is dying for Christ, giving his blood for Christ, and yet he says, I'm not worthy to be identified with my master. I cannot be crucified in the same fashion that the Lord died for us. He wanted to make that return, that full gift of himself, the way the Lord gave himself so completely to us. And yet uh, he exercised such a tremendous humility in that. Now, I, looking at this solidity that we have, all of us know that experience. Did you ever walk on something that's not real solid? You know, walk on a tree branch, you're kind of out there. Even there's a difference when you walk in a building that's built out of uh, cement or a building that's built out of, with wood floors. And you go up on the second floor of an old building, maybe softer, but you're kind of walking around in this old house like, you know, the floor is creaking around, and you can kind of feel it giving under you. The older it is, you begin to wonder, will I fall through? But a building that has a solid uh, floor, stone floor, you know, we feel really, there's something solid under our feet. It's never going to give way. And this is what we have in our faith. We don't question. We don't doubt. We have this certitude in living the truth because of what, how Jesus established his church upon the solid foundation, the rock of Peter. And so although we may, we may be challenged by that truth at times, although we may be convicted by that truth at times, we know it's the truth. And we know who Jesus Christ is. What I would invite you to do is to take this passage of Simon Peter. Here's Jesus asking this question. Well, who do people say that I am? And then that real convicting question, but who do you say that I am? He asked the world the same question today. He asks us the same question. Who's everyone saying that I am? 
there are many people who do not know Christ, and they'll say, well, he's this great prophet. And Jesus is asking us, do you think I'm just a great prophet? And that there is yet one more to come after me? Or am I the Messiah? Am I the one who is to come? Am I the one who has come into the world to redeem you? And in Peter, our faith is given voice. We say with Peter, no, you're not just a prophet. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Many times when uh, we elevate the Blessed Sacrament at Mass, uh, we teach our children to take the words of Scripture in order to express their faith. And so one of the classic things we learn as children is that when the priest elevates the host uh, for our adoration or for our reverence after the consecration, that we simply say, my Lord and my God. Now that comes from St. Thomas at the morning of the resurrection. My Lord, or a week after the resurrection, I'm sorry. My Lord and my God, and this is a, <clears throat> a profession of faith we can add to that if we uh, want to really give real expression of the fervor of our hearts, the passage of St. Francis, my God and my all. So I'd invite you when we elevate uh, the sacred host to have that profession of faith where we say, my Lord and my God, my God and my all. And then when the priest elevates the chalice, the precious blood, for our adoration. To say to ourselves or to say to him from our hearts this passage that Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. These are words of faith in expressing that we know who this is. And to add to that words of Peter again, when uh, he had this great conviction, he saw this miracle with our Lord. And he went before him and he said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Or the prayer of the, the publican in the, um, in the synagogue, when he stood in the back with his head bowed and he said, Have mercy on me, a sinner. And this is what we can say at that moment of uh, the elevation of the precious blood. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Now take the, our words directly from the scriptures and make them our own in our profession of faith. But to reflect on that in your prayer today, and I would even say in this coming week, just to use that phrase when you go to prayer, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it will deepen your own sense of faith in your heart. You're going to have a sense or a, a felt experience, I would dare to say, of this solidity or this a solid foundation on which we stand as believers because we know who Jesus is. And when we know who Jesus is, we know the truth and we've entered into the fullness of his truth. Um, we've entered into this a greater knowledge of him and he leads us into this mystery of himself. And then to look at, uh, very briefly, at St. Paul, who takes on the name from Saul to Paul. Notice that when he is Saul, he's known as this man who is exterminating Christians, trying to wipe them out of existence. But when he has this identity as Paul, he is multiplying Christians. He's giving new birth through baptism, through the preaching of the gospel. 
and increasing the number of Christians, not trying to wipe them out from the face of the earth, but to multiply their number over the whole face of the earth. You know, again, this beauty that when we receive this call from God, that he gives each of us a mission, and we all participate in this work of the church. Each of us is called to participate in the work of Jesus Christ, the mission of preaching the gospel to the whole world and bringing all mankind uh, to this knowledge of the Father. And we honor these two men for their, their great model and their great witness that they are to us.